So how does the onboard braking model work? Well, part of the reason for the delay in publishing this ETCS Bites Back is it's a topic I haven't totally understood or really wanted to investigate. It's one of those black arts. But I needed to look into it, so I thought it was worth sharing with you what I'd found out. Now, a key part of ETCS, as you all know, is the automatic train protection function. This is the functionality which continually monitors the speed of the train and intervenes if the train is going to exceed the speed limit or will not be able to slow down or stop at the next restrictive target. Key bits are that it continually monitors the speed. This is not like having a speed gun beside the railway to check the speed of the train at discrete places. It is a continual measurement. And as the train is approaching a reduced speed, it will be continually checking that the train is slowing down. And the other part is that the ATP can intervene. It can apply the brakes and it will apply the brakes and cause the train to be slowed down back within the safe limits and then hand back responsibility to the driver. So in order to have an ATP function, the onboard needs to know about the train that it's fitted to. And in particular for the braking model, it needs to know what type of brake system is fitted. It needs to know about how quickly the brakes will decelerate a train in the normal situation, often called the service brake. But it also needs to know what would happen if there was an emergency. The normal brakes may include things like rear static or regenerative braking, but in emergency they may not be available. So there needs to be a safe deceleration rate established for those situations. So what's the ATP function trying to do? Well, at any time it's calculating the distance that the train or brake need to brake in order to come to a reduced speed or a stop. And that rate of deceleration is going to vary. It's going to take account of the time from when the foot brakes are first evoked until they're fully effective. Now for modern multiple unit trains, then that's pretty much instantaneous. But for older trains, it can be a number of seconds. It needs to take account of the speed of the train. Different types of brakes are more effective or less effective at different speeds. It needs to think about the gradient under the train. A downhill gradient will mean that the deceleration is slower than if it's on an uphill gradient. And of course, railhead can be contaminated, so you may get adhesion factors to take account of as well. So where does this all come from? Well, if we've got a what we could call a standard train, such as a multiple unit that's produced in mass for the mass market, um, the 700s, the 800s in the UK, then what you can do is undertake some tests. You can anal do some analysis of the braking system, and that can give you a table of deceleration rates for different speeds. And that is referred to as the gamma model. However, other types of trains, freight trains particularly, vary number of wagons, how many locomotives, whether the wagons are loaded or not. But what you can do is estimate the deceleration rates by combining data from each of the individual vehicles about how heavy it is and how much brake force it can apply. And that's known as the lambda model. Now for the ETCS system, the gamma model is the native model. It is what it is designed around. However, if you are going to use the Lambda model, then you need to use a conversion process to take the data that the driver can enter and make it into something that's comparable with the gamma model. So let's take our fixed formation train. We've measured things like the maximum deceleration, the service deceleration, and the brake delay time, how quickly the brakes will be fully effective. And that is pre-programmed into the onboard by the supplier of the train or the integrator of ETCS onto the train. That information is then combined with some safety margins. 
and the information sent from the track, such as the gradients. In order to generate a series of guaranteed deceleration rates and guaranteed brake delays that can inform the curves that the onboard uses to work out how fast the train can be going at any particular time or distance from a reduction in speed. So that's the gamma model. If, however, our train is made up of variable wagons, then we are going to need to use the lambda model. The driver will enter the brake setting in as passenger or goods, we'll come back to what that means, and the combined brake percentage for the train. That is entered as part of start of mission and is then used through something called the conversion model to generate deceleration rates, brake delay times, which can feed into the same safety margins, track information and generate a similar output. So how do we get gamma data? Well, obviously we need a consistent train, or it could be combinations of trains. If you have multiple units which are two or three carriages long, then you may often operate them in multiple, in which case you can generate the data for one 150 or two 150s. And sometimes you can have combinations of different similar trains. Braking distance are measured for, you, for a different starting speeds on level dry track. And then one can apply statistical analysis to identify the likely variations in the stopping distances based on the likelihood of different parts of the brake system not working 100%, small failures, etc. And what you end up with is a set of safe deceleration rates with a confidence that that will be met by a train in real service. So those deceleration rates are stored in the onboard and they're defined by the integrator of the ETCS onto the train or the train supplier and they are the rolling stock factors. They will then be combined with other information regarding the train in order to generate the various curves. Now, what else could be influencing the brake rate? Well, one of the things is that we can send a national value from the track side, and that can say how confidently we want the train to be able to stop in the distance that it has calculated or selected and that is on dry rails. Why might the railway the infrastructure manager want to define this? Well, it depends on how much margin you build into your trackside design. If you have places that you want trains to stop, which are very close to hazards, then you'd obviously want a high confidence level, level that the train will not go past that limit. It is quite a difficult argument to work out what value to request. But typically you have a 50% likelihood, which is the most common distance that it will take a train to stop. And if you ask for much higher confidences, then the distance it will allow is significantly bigger. A high level is going to give you more safety confidence, but is probably going to impact your performance. Now, the other factor is to do with the available wheel rail adhesion. Rails are not always dry. Wheels are not always dry and they're not always in the best condition. On a nice hot sunny day, the grip may be really good, but on an overcast day or a wet day, the grip goes down. If you are in a, a nice hot country with very little rain, then you might set the real, real, sorry, wheel rail adhesion to a high number, meaning the rails are nearly always dry. If, however, you're in another part of the country or the world, then you might choose to set a lower value. So what do we do if we don't have a train that we can test? And that's particularly for a freight train or a passenger train where the number of carriages or wagons are changed. 
it would not be possible to test every combination and to take account of every possible set of instances where one wagon has the brakes isolated or similar. So the lambda model uses something called the brake percentage, and that can be calculated by the driver or the train examiner by taking information about the weight and the brake force of each of the vehicles. So how do we establish this? Well, UIC, the Union International Edition de Fair, have established a standard, UIC 544-1. And in that standard, they define the required braking distance, S, for a defined situation, such as dry rails at a certain starting speed. So for any speed, V, we can establish what is the required braking distance for the train as a whole. But if we are looking at individual vehicles, then they may take longer or less distance to stop than S. So that actual stopping distance allows the brake force to be calculated. How much more or less than the weight of the vehicle itself can be stopped in distance S? The brake force percentage is the brake force divided by the mass of the vehicle. These numbers are normally painted on the side of the wagons or available to the train examiner or the driver. So if we looked in UIC 544, we would see a set of curves of different speeds. And for each speed against the distance it takes to drop uh, to stop. So if we have a train traveling at, say, 180 kilometers per hour and it takes about 1700 meters to stop, then we can read off from the graph that the brake percentage is 130 percent. In other words, that vehicle or train can break more than 100 percent of its own weight and stop within the distance specified. Now, what about the brake timings? Well, there are two basic settings, G for goods and P for passenger. And the difference is how long it takes from when the brake is activated by the driver's control or the system to how long the, to the brakes becoming fully effective. In goods setting, it can be 20 to 30 seconds before the brakes become fully effective. And the reason for this is that older trains often only have one pipe to transfer the air pressure from the locomotives to all the wagons. And it takes time for the air to move down that pipe. So the slower time allows for propagation, which therefore means that the braking will be more consistent along the length of the train and you won't get heavy longitudinal forces between the vehicles. If you didn't do this, you'll get all the buffers clashing together and you could even get a derailment due to the back of the train still trying to go faster than the front of the train. The disadvantage, of course, is that this brake delay increases the braking distance because the brakes do not become effective as quickly. The passenger setting has typically faster build-up times, three and a half up to five seconds, or can actually be much faster with electrical brakes. That shortens the braking distance. However, it does mean that the train has to be capable of handling higher forces between the vehicles, and it does require a fast propagation of the brake system, normally done electrically. So, if we are looking at a lambda train, then the brake weight percentage is entered by the driver or train preparer, and the train type is entered as well, whether the brakes are working in the P or G setting. That is all fed through a conversion model in order to generate a series of brake curves that the train can use for the ATP function. But in addition, factors can be applied by the infrastructure manager as part of the national values. These are sent by the infrastructure in packet three, the national values. For a lambda train, subset 26 defines three correction values. KR int, which is all around the length of the train, 
and it's a factor of how effective the brakes will be based on the train length. A short train may have more effective brakes than a longer train. There is also KV int. KV int is related to the speed of the train. Braking systems react differently at different speeds. Disc brakes and, and tread brakes may have different characteristics. Also, if the train has got other factors such as uh, special brakes, they may affect the speed to brake rate of the train. So this value can be sent from the track side to configure how the train braking model will work for different speeds. And lastly, there is one value which impacts the emergency brake build-up time. How reliant is the infrastructure design on the brake system working quickly or not? But hang on, this is a brake model. What's all this national values? Why is the infrastructure manager getting involved? Well, partly because the brake, the train brake model only knows about the predicted brake efficiency. And that can vary. It has been calculated, and you know what the assumed one is, but on any particular occasion, the actual distance may vary. And the train and the track side need to come to a consensus about how good the braking performance really needs to be. So for instance, our blue curve here could show the nominal braking uh, curve, the most likely braking curve. However, the red curve could be a realistic braking curve in poorer conditions, and that will have a confidence interval, a likelihood that it is there. If we can tolerate braking actually being anywhere within the range as a track side, then we don't need a high confidence. If, however, we need to know that the blue curve is going to be achieved, then we would need to set a high required confidence. And that's one of the national values. The first one, NVEBCL, is for the gamma model and about how conservative it should be how much allowance should be taken for worn wheels, brake degradation, or anything else that affects the braking on a one-by-one -one basis. NVAVADH is, again, uh, for the gamma model, and is how much adjustment should be made for non-dry rails. It's one value for the whole country, but it can take account of the fact that one normally has wet or miserable conditions. The other three are the national values that affect the lambda trains for longer and shorter trains, faster or slower trains, and the timing interval. Because it affects the onboard, but is sent from the track side, and is sent to the, all trains from the track side, then establishing these, these values can be quite a testing commercial and uh, technological debate. But the end result is that we can calculate a set of curves. And the curves are what are used by the ETCS on board in order to control the indications to the driver, to decide at what point to warn the driver they need to brake, at what point to apply the brakes. And this applies both for ceiling speed when the train is not meant to be exceeding a speed, and also for when it is meant to be reducing its speed. So I hope that has given you a brief insight into the onboard brake model. Uh, I am still learning about it, and as I learn more, I may do a second episode.